Yama, everyone. It's Taylor Reed um, here from Revlaw, one of the co organizers. I am so excited about this session on systemic racism, power, and justice with Larissa Barant. Larissa is a Gamilaroi woman, lawyer, and distinguished professor. Um, welcome, Larissa. Oh, it's so nice to be here, Taylor. I first come across your work actually in law school um, and I've been such a fan ever since. Uh, one of the things I did was probably un, um, geniusly decided to do my thesis on double jeopardy. When I uh, come across your body of work and not just your work as a lawyer, but also your work as a black feminist. So um, this is absolutely a highlight for me today. Um, Part of our discussion, though, is going to be focused on your advocacy and your powerful legal work in the space of the Barrowville murders. Um, over 30 years ago this year, three Aboriginal children, Colleen Walker, 16 years of age, Evelyn Greenup, four years of age, and Clinton Speedy Duro, 16 years of age, went missing in Barrowville. These are known as the Barrowville murders and occurred over five months from September 1990 to February 1991 in Barrowville, New South Wales. One person has been acquitted of the murders of Clinton and Evelyn in separate trials. Colleen's remains have never been recovered and there has never been a prosecution in relation to her suspected murder. In 2006, the New South Wales Parliament enacted legislation that opens a new window to enable the trial of a person acquitted of an offence punishable by a period of life imprisonment. Where the Court of Criminal Appeal is satisfied that there is fresh and compelling evidence against the acquitted person, and that is in the interest of justice for the retrial to be made. Only one retrial application may be made. And I should say um, that uh, we are thinking in credit to the families for sharing this story. Um, and Larissa, you have carved out a space for yourself in the legal profession that sets your advocacy apart in this particular space. Can you tell us the legal strategies you have used in this case and explain where this matter is now up to? Okay, thanks so much, Tila. It's such a great introduction. And I, I just want to join you in acknowledging the role the family has played. And, and I know when I hear you speak about the importance of movement lawyering, one of the really key things about it is to really give voice to the people who are affected by the system. And, you know, I think that's been a very important strategy in terms of, of Barraville. And I became aware of the case when it happened, I think most Aboriginal people knew of the case at the time and the rest of Australia has become more aware of it in recent years, mostly because of the advocacy by the families. And I guess, you know, in terms of the approaches that, that I take, I think like many First Nations lawyers, I didn't come to do law because I wanted to just be a lawyer. I, want, I, be, I was interested in doing law because I wanted to change a system that had deeply affected my own family, both through having um, a, a history of child removal policies affecting the generations of my family before me, um, being obviously from a, a, a community Aboriginal nation that had been dispossessed, and having extended family member die in custody as one of the as one of the um, investigations that was done under the Royal Commission. So very personal reasons as to why we come to law. So I think we think about it differently in terms of how we approach it. I think another important thing for, for me um, and the team at Jambana who worked with me on the Barraville, uh, on the Barraville matter is that um, we didn't get involved in it until the family came to us and asked us, even though it was something that was really interesting to us. And I think there's that thing about, you know, being being asked by a community and coming in respectfully rather than starting to think about an issue that might interest us and then kind of imposing ourselves on it. Um, and I think there was a, a wonderful way in which the community um, worked with us that helped me think about my lawyering really differently. 
Um, some of the first discussions I had when I'd met with the families when I first got involved, uh, which is over 10 years now, um, was to talk of the, the case had stalled at that time and, and people were interested in, in getting attention. And it was really their reflection that said um, where, where they had noticed that only the only two times that there had been a movement in their own case had been when there had been coverage on the ABC of, of, the, of the issue. Um, and so they had understood how important that media presence had been in terms of progressing their case. And we worked, so we worked with them around a range of strategies, which really also reflect the concept of movement lawyering. So one of the things they wanted to do was a documentary. Um, there was some um, discussions about changing the legislation and there was some discussions about um, some political lobbying uh, to the Attorney General to try and get the case progressed in terms of making a recommendation under the double jeopardy law. So there was also, just to clarify, that the change to the legislation was to change the wording of that double jeopardy um, law to, so that it would better suit the circumstances of the family. And the other thing we decided to do uh, as lawyers um, was to try and lobby for that parliamentary inquiry. And we were told by everyone it would never happen. This is not the sort of thing that a parliamentary inquiry is held, held into. Um, and absolutely, it ended up being uh, taking place and being a quite significant um, documentation of what had happened to the families. Uh, it included a recommendation about those changes to the legislation that, that hasn't been implemented. But, you know, I, I would really say that, that it was working so closely with the families and listening to what they wanted and thinking about what options they had that made us have to think differently about um, being a lawyer. So if, if I've got these strategies, I have to say I've been taught them by the community. And you've really kind of nailed it in the sense that this seemed to be motivated and directed by the self-determination of the families that had driven the, the nature of the advocacy and the legal strategies that you then deployed in a case like this to create public awareness. That's absolutely right. And in fact, that's what we saw our roles as being as, as lawyers and academics uh, was that we had to speak to the community and hear what they wanted, listen to what they wanted and act on that, not go in and say, this is what the law is. So this is what you can and can't do. This is how far you can go. And this is where it stops. We didn't, we didn't start from that position. We started from a position of um, the, the family knows best what the family wants. And we, it's our responsibility and our job to find the best way to deliver that for them. And that's why we were looking at things like a parliamentary inquiry, which would have been outside the, the, you know, the parameters of looking at it as a, as a straight legal case. And, and, you know, every lawyer that we spoke to, non-Indigenous lawyer, um, always said, oh, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. Um, and there were two things that frustrated me about that. One was the narrowness of the thinking and the fact that there were things we could do. They weren't taking the case to court as the only option. And the second thing about it um, that really bothered me was how little um, respect was shown to the voices of the families, how, how the kind of idea that you could just close this case down meant that their voices were not being, were continually not being heard. And what you kind of um, inherently kind of like your instincts, particularly, as you say, as a First Nations lawyer, even from your own family experiences and then coming up against, you know, the advice of non-Indigenous lawyers in this space who keep kind of almost creating roadblocks in a sense. You also mentioned that, you know, this is personally driven for you because, I, I, you know, speaking about advocacy generally, they don't teach you at law school about the impact of the stolen generations here or the impact of the judicial process and those systems. And so while you're taking this case um, and, and driving the, the systemic changes, there's so much more going on for our mob, isn't there? Well, that's right. It's, and, and I feel like it, it all becomes 
interrelated. And, and I think there's a couple of really important things that you're you're talking about there, Tila. The first is the 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 way in which we we're not taught enough to think critically while while we're at law school. The second is this idea that many people still have that to be a good lawyer means being neutral um, and, in, and uh, dispassionate. And I just completely disagree with that. Um, and, and, you know, I think we also come to see, look, we, we arrive knowing Laura is about a power relationship. And I think people can go easily through their whole law degree and never think about the power imbalances that are perpetuated by that legal system that people then blindly go and work in. And I think that's, that says a lot about the failings of our legal education framework. Um, and it says a lot about the way in which as lawyers, we're often trained to not question the system that, you know, if you, if you want to work for Indigenous people, you go and work for legal aid and you process people going through the criminal justice system is what they're teaching you. Now, you and I know having both had that experience of working at Legal Aid, that, that that's not what we're there doing. And we find lots of ways to subvert that. But that's because of what we've been trained outside of the law school to do. And, you know, from our communities, from our parents, from our, from our grandparents about a broader concept of what law, what, what law is, what justice is and what it means to be an advocate. And I just think, you know, so much that has been powerful in this case and elevated um, it into the public consciousness because you really have done that with the, the number of strategies that you've implemented. It's highlighted, though, both, I think, in, in these systems that we're dealing with in Australia, the real tension between the judicial and the political systems. And as lawyers, I know, especially as a First Nations lawyer, I get it a lot. You know, we're told to stay in our lane, to do law um, and, and keep politics out of it. I guess, you know, I really want to hear from you, like how have you straddled that so graciously um, and powerfully at the same time, I guess, ensuring that the self-determination of these families um, is, isn't here to? I guess um, part, there's a part of it that was knowing that when someone told me I had to choose between being a legal academic and a practitioner, that that was really bad advice. It might have been the advice for achieving um, success in a very limited way, within the legal profession once upon a time. I don't think that's true as a general rule now. And I certainly don't think that's how we as First Nations lawyers would ever define success. To us, success is about making an impact in the community and having the community be a better place because of the work we've done. That's our measure of success. So freeing myself from that um, was the first thing. Um, and and the second thing was, I guess, um, you know, I. I feel like um, I was very lucky to grow up in a really strong community that that taught me about the importance of advocacy above all else. And, you know, we get trained as lawyers to have a very narrow view of what advocacy is. Um, but I think from where, when, where we grow up as First Nations people, we come from a really long line of people who have been advocating for change in really different ways and in some ways what I feel is like my father's generation were that generation that knocked down the, the doors of the university to let my generation in people like me and my brother and Terry Janke and Robin Quiggan and Tony McAvoy that first wave of us that were coming in pretty much from from high school into university and, and so our responsibility wasn't to the legal profession. Our responsibility was to the community. Um, and, you know, I, I, I feel too, Teela, um, and I know when I've heard you speak, this sort of resonates with me. At the end of the day, we go home to the community. We, we leave the community to go to work, but we live in the community. We don't live in the legal profession. And that's where I think our biggest accountability is. So there's probably two things to sum up from that in terms of what's been my experience. The first was being really lucky to have those strong values and knowing what was important early on and kind of being guided by that. And feeling like that was more important to me than than any other kind of success, any other measure of success. 
and you know, the, 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 it's kind of strange because that success has followed, but I don't think I would have been as good at what I did if I'd in any way tried to stifle my passion for it. Um, I think I think that's been a really important part of it. So just sort of letting go from what the expectations of the profession are, I think has been been the other really important part of that. Um, thinking of a, a of a self defined idea of what it means to be a successful advocate rather than what the profession might think. And it's so powerful when you literally have just said that, you know, we get told at law school, at college of law, in our jobs, we're maintaining our training, our ultimate, you know, first paramount duty to the court, you know, duty to the law. And that that is precisely where the tension is for us as First Nations lawyers. Our, Our obligations are to our communities. And that raises lots of ethical issues um, and tensions as an advocate. Well, it does, not it, you know, in a way, in the way the legal fr- legal system is framed. But I feel sometimes that I don't know how you feel about this, but I, um, I'm sure you've been in the same position where people sort of impose that, that view upon you, that you are, you know, um, you know, not not behaving like a lawyer should because you're doing things outside of just running cases. And I just don't agree with that. I feel like if my responsibility and our main responsibility as lawyers is to our clients, that is our paramount responsibility. So when we take on um, working, the privilege of working with a group of people like the Bowerville families, that is my first obligation. And I feel that that's kind of a paramount thing. I think where the legal profession does itself a disservice in terms of thinking narrowly about that obligation, and this isn't, this is something they can learn from how we culturally approach this, is that we give paramount views to those to those people who come to us and say this is what we want want and we think strategically about how to achieve that for them rather than look narrowly at what the law says you can and can't do and try and fit them into that box and say well actually if you if you can't meet these legal tests well unfortunately there's nothing we can do for you i mean you and i both know that's not where it ends for us and and nor would we ever accept that that system is right so that's why you you know your next strategy is to keep changing that law. Your next strategy is to keep making sure you've got a forum where people can hear these voices. Um, you know, I, I, I think if you take a broad view about um, and a thoughtful view about being the best advocate for your client and don't think narrowly about it, some of those ethical choices that people tell you are attention um, are less of attention because, you know, they're trying to put you in a way really uh, I mean, they're not worried about us not doing the best things for our client. They're worried about us being disruptors within the legal system and upsetting a power system that's worked very well for them. You know, I know I've heard you talk about this and it, and it resonates with my experience too, um, especially when I went through law school and there were fewer Aboriginal people doing it. And, you know, we were just in that first wave of, of you know, a larger number coming through. But, you know, everyone else in our class um, were were. were were the children of lawyers or judges or really privileged people. It was rare to even have somebody from a public school, let alone have an Aboriginal person there. So, so you know, these are people who don't have the same sense of reality. And, and in a way, what I would argue is that they're the poorer for that. A First Nations person walking into a, to a, a law school, understanding things like the impact of the removal policy and its current manifestation today where we're seeing that, that increased rates of Indigenous child removal, knowing from our own family experience about, first of all, not just how we're over-policed and over-represented, but we are less likely to believed and treated uh, worse if we're victims of crime are things that we just grew up knowing. So we walk in with a much richer worldview and a much more sceptical view of, of what the law is. And that that is a much better starting point for somebody as an advocate um, than coming in and thinking the system's really fair and there's nothing here to provoke me to think about that. Yeah. And if we take, you know, this, the example or the really, you know, this 
awful experience the Barrowville families have now been through for an entire generation, you know, the 30 years that they have um, had this battle. I, I guess the next question for you then is, you know, with the legal steps you've taken, with the inquiries that have happened in these cases, with three children that have not yet, you know, sought justice for their lives, why has it been so difficult do you think in this instance um i i would i make these following comments not just based on this case but on a series of other cases that i've worked on um so it's there's a, commu a cumulative experience that says to me that the first thing that went wrong in this case and this was admitted not just you know, not, it's not something that, that I've just observed and the pe people like you who've worked on this have observed. This is something that's been admitted by the police and was a finding of the parliamentary inquiry that the initial investigation into the um, the disappearance of, of these children was not treated seriously, was not investigated properly and was clouded by racist assumptions like that the children had gone walkabout, words of the police, um, and the an initial botching of that investigation where evidence was lost, um, so the best cases weren't put forward, um, was a big part of the problem. In addition to that, and this is um, underplayed a lot in this in this case, in the Barraville case, because a lot of um, a, a lot of the blame for the failure of, of a prosecution has fallen on the police and there's no doubt there is a, a very strong list of things that were done wrong. But if you look through every attempt to prosecute these cases, it was done half-heartedly. So there is actually also um, a, a, a lesser, um, uh, you know, a, a lesser observed, lesser commented upon problem in terms of the way these cases were prosecuted. And it's almost like people don't want to question what, the way that lawyers run a prosecution case, as though we're overstepping our boundaries if we're critical of that. And then, so, so what I have observed in cases like this, and I've seen many of them, I'm dealing with another horrendous example from WA, and in reading that, where there was initial police failure and a whole range of systemic failures, um, that there then seems to be a, a, an absolute failure of the system to be able to admit it's made a mistake. There's an absolute failure of the system to want to correct itself. Uh, there's an absolute failure of the system to want to reflect on what's gone on and make substantial changes to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, so, so we tend to see that there is all, always either with a, when we see a miscarriage of justice or something that that's led to an injustice, dismissed as the as a one off, which it never is, and then it's sort of dismissed as though there was a you know one bad cop who did the wrong thing or one bad person who did the wrong thing without ever acknowledging there was a systemic problem. And we have, I mean, the thing that strikes me too about the Barraville case is that. Those murders happened in 1990 and 1991. In 1991, we get that blueprint of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which is an exhaustive litany of recommendations that would go to the heart of almost every issue that comes up in every coronial inquest we have into a death in custody, every miscarriage of justice. You're always there saying these are the recommendations of the Royal Commission that have been ignored in this case. So it becomes this important benchmark. We have those things that sit there and as, as you know, um, really good mirrors to hold up to the legal profession and the legal profession just refuses to look into that mirror. And I guess then, you know, if we think about what was happening in, a, in around the late 80s, early 90s, um, exactly what you say, we've come out of a one of the biggest royal commissions our nation has seen, we're still talking about it. Um, you know, let's be real, if, if this was three white kids in the one town from the same community, would we still be here in the same place? Would this happen to Barrowville? I think that's absolutely right. And in, think, in fact, I think one of the most powerful pieces of advocacy I saw the families do in relation to the way that that they worked in terms of the approach to the um, parliamentary inquiry and in their approach with the documentary was to try and get the members of parliament they were dealing with to see them as parents 
to try and take race out of it, even though race was the defining reason why we are talking about this. But in terms of impressing upon them as parliamentarians why it was so important to um, have some movement in this case and fix some of the issues that it highlighted, um, that was part of their um, strategy and it was really effective. On the day that the parliamentary report was handed down, which was accepted unanimously in, in the upper house of the parliament, um, every person who spoke to the report when they got to their feet in that parliament started by saying, as a parent, as a parent, as a parent. And I thought it was such an achievement on the part of the families to get them to that point because the problem was when those children went missing, none of the people who were involved in investigating and helping to solve those crimes thought the same way. They didn't think of this as a, as a parent-child issue they, or, or a, you know, a, something that's affecting parents and children. They saw it as a black issue, as an Indigenous problem and, you know, just didn't put the effort into it, didn't think it, it was take it seriously, allowed their own own prejudices to, to block their own views. That, that, that um, you know, it's a, it's a very powerful thing to be able to say, um, if you take away my race, you would have treated me differently and to be able to prove that as, as, as clearly as our Barraville families have done that. It's almost like, you know, when, when you explain that, I, I just, you know, can feel how frustrating it must be um, because it's almost like they're fighting for the dignity, dignity to be recognised as humans and people that matter in the community and the fact that it was their children that went missing is, is almost the most simple thing that they're asking for justice in this instance. Look, I think that's such an important point, Teal, and to me that's almost the most heartbreaking thing about it. And 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 what makes me so frustrated in terms of their treatment in that context is that I see that prejudice in so many other parts of my work. That thing to fail to appreciate what it means as a parent to lose a child just because that parent is Aboriginal, that was exactly not just part of the initial in, uh, failure to um, investigate the case properly, but has riddled decision-making through this case in most of the time that I've been involved with it. I see that same level of not being able to appreciate the, the, the extent to which, like any an Aboriginal parent is like any other parent, in the child removal space, the sorts of assumptions that are made there. And, you know, I worked on another film recently called In My Blood It Runs about a little 12-year-old boy in Alice Springs. Beautiful story um, about but, but that sort of shows a, a, a young child who's really bright and gifted and especially very culturally um, aware, um, has a lot of healing powers and had every chance, every chance of falling through um, the education system and really shows the shadow under which an Aboriginal family lives with over-policing and, and, and the, the threat of uh, child removal, child protection intervention. And when we were talking to the families about what message they wanted to keep audiences to have from this film as we were starting to think about how we would, we would roll it out, the first thing they said, Teela, was we just want people to know that we love our children. And it just breaks my heart that we live in a society where an Aboriginal person has to feel like that is a radical idea that we love our children. I mean, just just think of the racism that's in that in that worldview that makes you feel like that's something that you have to say and something that you have to prove. And imagine what that means for so many Aboriginal people to live under that under that shadow of always being judged and knowing that. And I had seen it really play out in Barraville. I mean, I, I tell this story often. It's one of the reasons I decided to write after story about the connection between parents and children and how long the, the death of a child will impact a family because I saw a senior member of the legal profession say to one of the parents, you know, you should just get some counselling and get over it. And I just could not imagine he would ever have said that to the parent of any other child that had gone missing in such public circumstances. You just wouldn't say it. You wouldn't say it if you were a human being to another human being. So why is it okay to say it to our parents? 
Mm, and, you know, your example then of um, In My Blood It Runs um, and you, through that piece of storytelling, gave such a powerful voice to Joanne, who I'm sure many that um, are watching here uh, saw or if not haven't already seen this year and last year, it honestly was one of the most amazing pieces of storytelling I've seen and I've shared it with so many people. But what I think come through in that was exactly how powerful our kids are. And, you know, this notion of um, how spiritual they are as well. And when we listen to them, that comes through. And it's almost like uh, I'm, I'm writing something at the moment and I'm trying to bring these layers in, you know, how, you know, the spiritual and, and the Western notions. But Duan is that force. And it's almost like Western society and Western laws shut themselves off from, from that part of who we are as First Nations people. So if you haven't seen My Blood It Runs, please do, everyone. Um, the other thing, back to Barrowville, Larissa, was in this case, there has been such an emphasis and on the advocacy around pushing for a retrial. Do you think um, that this is the hallmark of justice in this instance or not? Look, I, I think we need to take a really broad view about what justice means to First Nations people. And the only reason why in this case it's been such a, a, you know, a defining feature of what justice looks like is that's because what that's what the families have said. And you, you would often hear them say, you know, they didn't want compensation, they didn't want money. It, what they wanted was a day in court. That's what justice looked like to them. And, and so from our point of view, if that's what they wanted, that's what we worked so hard to try and find a way to give them. And, you know, I, I, I think there's something really interesting about, about why that was the case. And, and in many ways, I don't think it was because of any faith in the court system or, you know, or any, any, um, belief that if there was a conviction that would heal anything. I mean, I, I'm, you know, 100% sure that it wasn't that simple. What I think it was, was a big part of it was knowing that if they hadn't been treated in such a racist manner, a day in court was what they would have got. And and a proper day in court with a case run properly with all of the evidence put before the court. And that's in a way what, what, what people were saying to us. We just wanted to have what any other person would have, which is to have this person judged against all these things. So I think even if that had have been what in some ways people were saying justice looks like a day in court, um, I don't think there was a single person that we were working with who would have said that's that's where it ends. You know, that's it's a it's one part of what justice looks like. And the other thing that strikes me so much about the Barraville families, and I see this a lot in our families who have had a member of the family die in custody and continue tirelessly to fight for justice, is they are well aware that although the justice they're fighting for might be in a narrow sense, you know, an inquiry, a finding, or whatever, a, a, a conviction, um, a, a, um, a charges being laid, whatever that is, um, they know that, that that won't heal, but they also know that the advocacy that they have uh, will, will hopefully, their ambition is always to make sure it doesn't happen to another family. And you hear that all the time, you know, and I, you look at, you know, the amazing advocacy, say, of Aunty Tanya Day's family. No way is the legislative changes that they've been able to get through in Victoria going to heal the, the hurt that they've had or change what's happened to them. But they must know that by making that change to legislation, they have ensured that there will be other families that didn't lose a, a beloved member because of what they've done. And I, I feel like there's an element of when people are fighting for justice that they know full well that part of their pathway is about changing the things that have not worked in the system for them. It's about that systemic change. And we know, especially as First Nations peoples, these systems really aren't capable of, of healing these past traumas and wounds. But um, what you have 
articulated really well here is that movement lawyering um, and being a rebellious lawyer exactly like you are is ultimately about listening to the voices on the ground and following the direction of self-determination. In this instance, that was, you know, the, the Barraville families. Um, before I let you go, I, I kind of want to change it up a little bit here because you are a amazing writer and for those that are following um probably do are on black Father book club as well i've pumped your work out so much um you brought out after story this year you've got other novels as well i guess what i wanted to ask you was you know this power of storytelling in our communities and how um uh, you know how powerful and with what authority our oral storytelling comes from as well in our in our communities yeah, I um, I guess felt um, like I got drawn into writing more um, fiction because it allowed me to think more about um, the, talking about bigger thematics that I was seeing in my work. And I guess um, then now exploring more um options and avenues of storytelling through film has been another evolution of that and in a in a way I guess um you know as as most things when when we learn our our way culturally we we always think we're learning one thing and then we get to a point where we realize we've learned something else and I I thought along the way I was I was thinking about how I could be a more useful advocate by talking about the stories behind the legal issues and I guess what I've I've come to appreciate as as I've gotten much older and um and thought more deeply about what I was doing is that it it really was about trying to capture and give space to the storytelling traditions of my own culture and I think that's why I moved from doing novel writing, which I'll continue to do. I love it as a form and, and particularly for me, it's a place where I can write about things that I would find really hard to write about um, if factually, you know, for example, the, the, the book about my father, um, legacy, or, or even talking about uh, the impact of victims of crime. It's not my story to tell their stories in that way. I guess that's the thing that I've learnt um, along the way is the importance of what our role is as storytellers. And I feel like I've been on a really long journey to think more about my role as a storyteller. And now I think a big part of it, particularly with film, is more about finding those times where I can tell a story and to the extent to which I can create space within my storytelling to let somebody else tell their own story. And, and that, I think, has helped me think more deeply about the importance and sacredness of storytelling um, and to think about it more culturally. So I think I've developed as a storyteller over time, not necessarily because my skills have developed, though of course they have, the more we do it, the, the, the more our intuition uh, starts to, to, you know, um, you, you know, be, we, we, we trust our intuition more. Um, you know, after stories are much more ambitious Te and technically more difficult story than other things I've done. So sure, your your skill develops over time, but I think it's helped me come back to think about the the importance and responsibility of storytelling in our own community, and to to really come back and embrace that, and and value that, and celebrate its role in in our culture and see that as as a way in which I, I am engaging in a cultural practice, you know. Um, it's not just doing things like the possum cloak making that, that are a cultural practice, but storytelling is. And it's taken me a long time to be really reflective about that. And and I'm glad I'm there now. And and I really credit, you know, the people like the Barraville families who made me think about that, that being an advocate isn't always about telling someone else's story. It's about creating the space and getting out of the way and letting them tell their story. That's often the most powerful way to, to um, make change. And I think I learned that a lot um, in relation to doing after the apology as well, which was really about, you know, uh, about showing the agency of people uh, to make change and really finding ways 
to um, give voice to people who the system makes voiceless. That's another really important part, I think, of what we would do as as, as uh, when we're engaged in rebellious lawyering um, or movement lawyering um, is to to find ways in our practice, the way that we we practice our profession and the way that we practice what we do um, to find those spaces. So so that's why I think we get more creativity coming into it because we're finding ways to be subversive within the system. I really think, you know, that that is your gift. Your gift is storytelling and your gift is creating that space um, for, for others to tell their stories and their voices to come through. And it's absolutely true. Here in Australia, our ancestors are the original storytellers. And I think that's one thing that this country is yet to value and it's yet to realise. And I think the more, you know, we have amazing rebellious lawyers like you coming through and also non-Indigenous lawyers who understand the importance of creating that space um, for these voices in many different forums, our profession is going to be so much more equipped to deal with the systemic issues beyond just the courtroom as well. So with that, um, the last question, and I wanted to give you a chance to leave us um, with some of your work as well, but what's your top three tips to be a rebellious lawyer? Um, I would say the, f- the first is to... Um, uh, value your your passion and your um, determination to make change over what people define success as within the profession. Um, I think there is an, uh, particularly for non-Indigenous people, an obligation to learn more about the experiences of marginalised people within the system to really understand what's going on and what the impact is of when we when we fail. Um, and my my third is uh, would be to um, you know really engage with um, the voices of people who are seeking to make change like yourself, um, people like Chelsea Watergo, who really can give you real life examples of what's wrong with the system and how um, it needs to change, and be listening to those stories of people affected by it to really understand where we need to be making those changes. Um, You know, I think you need to be bold. I think you need to be brave. And I would say this, I I sometimes feel like we could have better advocates from non-Indigenous people if they were braver. You know, sometimes people who want to be our allies don't speak up because they're worried about offending somebody. And it always reminds me of the words of Martin Luther King when he said, it's not the words of our enemies but the silence of our friends that we remember the most. And I think as I've I've had more life experience, I think there's a lot in that. If you don't speak up at the time when people need you to speak up, nobody cares what you have to say when it's safe again to say something. Um, And I think there have been times, I think about the time of the Northern Territory intervention, where a lot of people who would claim to be human rights supporters were so silent when the Racial Discrimination Act was was, um, repealed, was suspended, um, and sort of went, oh, well, it's an Indigenous issue and, you know, I shouldn't really get involved. Um, If you want to be silent when the worst human rights breaches are happening in Australia, then, you know, I think you really have to question the effect, the the extent to which you'll be an effective advocate. So I think you need to get yourself educated and you need to find your voice and you need to use that voice when that voice is needed the most. Jane Caro, a middle-class white woman, said this really well. She said, people tell me that, you know, um, I I shouldn't talk on these things, but if I am a privileged middle-class white woman and I can't speak out when I think something's wrong, what chance is there for the rest of us? So using what privilege you have to be able to be an advocate when other people aren't and then moving out of the way when they can speak for themselves, that's the life lessons you need to teach yourself. Well, with that, that was so amazing. Thank you for all of your time. I know that you've worked in so many different spaces now. We've got so much. I feel like we could talk for more. Um, There was one piece of work you would like to leave this Oh, yes. 
Yes, yeah, so this is a clip from after the apology and, and why I've used it is because I think everything I've learned about storytelling from the Barrowville families is in uh, Help Me With This Story. And I think it shows, first of all, the power of hearing a story in somebody's own voice about injustice rather than us explaining it as a lawyer. So I'd ask you to reflect on that if you're listening to this for the first time about how powerful uh, this is in terms of you understanding that something is wrong with this issue. And I, I just wanted to also show it because it shows a very clever technique. I've used rotoscoping in this um, in this to, to have a line drawing. You can tell uh, that the woman speaking is a First Nations woman, but I've taken the colour of her skin out. It was a very powerful um, way of, of having a, um, trying to, to explain something from a parent's point of view without being dismissed because of the colour of your skin that I saw used effectively in African-American filmmaking and adopted it in this space. And just finally, the problem for many people who've had an injustice in the child protection system is that there are legal prohibitions on being able to talk about the case. So if you've had something happen to you that is egregious and wrong, you can't talk about it. So look at how we've used animation to allow somebody to speak in their own voice about their own experience of injustice, but still keep within the laws of keeping them anonymous. Thank you, Larissa, and we hope you all tune in to the link that we're going to provide um, after the apology. Thank you. So we're going to take um, some questions now, Larissa. Thank you for joining us. I know um, you've had a busy week and you've actually um, had an eye operation. So That's we're just right. super thankful that you can still come online um, because we have now over 400 participants here um, who have just watched that presentation and we've got some really amazing questions coming in. We're not going to keep you for too long, Larissa. Um, but the first question that we have right now is one that I actually am kind of interested in your answer as well. It's what suggestions do you have for practicing lawyers um, so they can better connect with government and policy officers to better inform their systemic changes or advocacy? Look, um, look, I think that's a great question. I should just say thanks for making making it uh, the session so that I, we could have that great conversation and um, I didn't miss out because of this surgery and I'm sorry that I'm looking a bit too cool with the sunnies on but I don't want to scare anyone. Um, I've just been so inspired by the conversation so far so it's great to um, to um, to be able to participate again and it's great that people are feeling motivated. Look I would say I think a really big part of of thinking about that is to not go it alone and don't seek to do things just within a small realm. I think it's really important in this space to join coalitions and to appreciate that there may be other people that have already started or doing the work that you're looking to do. And there is, there is real power in numbers in terms of um, law reform. So one of the first things I think if you're uh, in your own practice seeing an injustice would be to reach out to other people who are working in a similar area and who have the appetite to want to do that change and to importantly, um, and I guess this goes back to one of the real principles of movement lawyering that's come out this morning, is to be connecting with the part of the community that wants to see that change as well. So for example, a lot of the work that we do at Jambana, um, we would uh, around advocacy and, and reform of say the um, coronial system or the criminal justice system would be led by the work that we're doing with um, our First Nations people who are um, dealing with issues in those jurisdictions so that they're almost the first and foremost voice. And we partner too with like-minded people. We've got a very strong partnership, for example, with the National Justice Project, which goes all the way back to our work um, in bringing litigation around the Northern Territory intervention. So I think a really good part of that strategy, first of all, is to find where your allies are and be really strategic about it and build on the efforts that are already there and, and particularly um, where uh, your allies might have those really strong community uh, connections. I think that's a, a very good first place to, to start. 
And strategy is so important, is it? You and I have been texting all morning since like Vince <laughs> came on and we're, we're so inspired by his international keynote as well. And one of the things is, I guess, you know, it says a lot about you both bouncing back from this operation, Vince on his year, you know, on off his sabbatical coming in and zooming in as well from, from overseas, how committed movement lawyers and rebellious lawyers are to this kind of work. One of the things that um, really resonated with me, both from kind of our conversations and what Vince also said that I think aligns with your work was this notion of um, failing, failing, feeling like failures as lawyers. Um, but the community seeing that and feeling it in a different way as propelling their issue forward. And I can see from Barrowville that there has been so many different setbacks. And Vince gave the example of the lawyer going back into the community and having to explain losing a case. I guess, you know, my question to you is firstly, how do you deal with that? And I think how pivotal uh, are setbacks um, in, in moving particularly cases like Browville forward? That's Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, I did feel when I heard Vince say that he'd, t he'd taken time from his holiday that I felt that I think for him and I that the, the excitement of having a forum to talk about work that hasn't been spoken about before um, is too hard to resist. So I want to thank you and, and everyone who's made that possible. I mean, it's just great from our own perspective to take a moment to think about it in a way we probably don't. Um, and I thought that was really help, a really helpful um, if you're helpful reflection. I think if, if you thought about winning as how, in terms of this space being how many times you actually win in court, um, you would really be, first of all, incredibly demoralised. <laughs> and secondly, you know, you'd be missing the point. And, you know, on the, on the times that we do win, I, the whole team, you know, and I work with a big team. As I mentioned, we work a lot with the National Justice Project. Whenever we win something, we, we, we kind of almost joke about it and go, oh, yeah, that's right. This is what winning feels like because it's so rare. But it, it's really important. And I guess this is the part where Vince talks about the fact that you've got to be really humble and your idea of being the hero lawyer who's going to come in like in an episode of, you know, law and order and change the day. You know, that's just not how how this life works. Um, you're usually part of a larger story and sometimes you're the B story in that story. Um, and I guess it's absolutely right. And 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 you, you sometimes need to understand that what is being asked for uh, that you're going into court for isn't isn't necessarily the win. It's the importance of hearing a voice heard or an issue heard and drawing attention to an issue. It is also, and I think importantly, um, this is, you know, this came out in our conversation. It's about realizing that a lot of this is about raising um, a, a attention to an injustice where the systems failed to fix the system so it doesn't happen to anyone else. And it's probably a good moment just to take um, a minute to acknowledge the work done in South Australia overnight, where Latoya Rule and a group of of advocates have changed the spithood legislation. Latoya's uh, brother had had um, died in custody in a spit hood, and they've advocated for that one change. It's a in some ways that can seem like a small change, but I think what Latoya and everyone who's advocated with with them can appreciate is that that means that it's highly likely that that won't happen to another family. So. I think the thing about movement lawyering is that it is about a movement. It's about structural change and it's about systemic change. So it's hard for us when we're in the weeds of our individual case to see that. So for me, I think part of that is goes back to the idea of making sure you're really in tune with where you sit as part of the broader movement. It's about making sure that you're um, you know that you're listening very closely to what your what what the community that you're working for wants and what their ambitions are, and the, and what I would say, Teela, and, and we've spoken about this before. I think is it's not what where you find the joy in this part of of um, of of working isn't in the wins. It's actually in those moments when you're with the community and the community sees you like family. The times that the Barabilville case, I feel like I've been successful in that, despite 
what might look like not wins on the board has been moments where it's been a family only thing and the families turn to me and go, that includes you. You know, to me that they are the moments where you realize you've listened and you've become a real part of what, what that, you've stood with those families in those shoes. And I think that's sort of, um, you know, how you, how you need to reposition yourself to, to be intuitive about how to navigate this space. Yeah, and it was really um, amazing to see the news coming overnight um, with the work Latoya and her family have been doing. And it just goes to show that these multiple strategies do work. Um, and the other thing that kind of really I've been reflecting on today is between yours and Vince's work, he spoke about this 500 year battle on that continent there. You've been on this 30 year battle for justice for these families here in Barrowville. Um, I guess, what were the next steps for, for this case, do you think? Well, look, I think where it sits at the moment with decisions that have been made there in terms of where the, the, legal, the legal system has stopped with two of the cases with them, with the fa failure to Im implement the legislation that was recommended by the parliamentary inquiry. Uh, and and one case still hasn't been run, so Colleen's case is, is still open. Um, it means that there are other solutions that need to be looked at now, and um, and just you know still working behind the scenes. What I will say, um, without you know, this is obviously something that the the families are working on, and I don't want to betray a confidence, but just to say. They, st they are still working. And one thing that I've always admired about them is that they've always got a plan B. Every time a door's closed, they were always ready to go with the next thing. And, and uh, if anyone thinks that just because there's no legal avenue left that those families have stopped fighting, they, they, they are wrong. Um, there's another very powerful documentary coming out about their story updated from when they did their first one. Um, you know, they, they will continue to raise awareness about this. And I would say the other thing that they have done is they, which, you know, is just one of the, the offsets that, that would be invisible to other people. So it's worth sort of talking about. They might not have had any justice in that narrow sense in their case, but their work, particularly through the parliamentary inquiry, has led to changes in police training about issues around race. Now, you know, that is not a small thing um, for them to have achieved, which has been something that many people have been advocating for, but it came directly out of their inquiry. So, you know, I, I think you can't underestimate it. And I think the sad thing for, for um, the broader community is that they don't see how much power these families have, how much change they've done, and they're just not the sort of people who'll sit there and blow their own horn about it. They're too busy getting on with something else. But, you know, I'm really pleased to be able to share that with a group of lawyers that actually the, the, this group of people from Barraville who've had no legal training whatsoever have continued to, in their own way to make substantial changes through a legal system that let them down. Well, finally, thank you so much for your time. You really have raised the bar in terms of um, how important our storytelling is, and you've done that across a number of mediums and your body of work speaks for itself. Um, while everyone else now goes to lunch, um, we wish you well. Um, thank you for joining us. And we are now going to show, while people pop off to their lunch break, and still sit behind the screen your um your after the apology video so here it is everyone thanks taylor thanks everyone see ya bye I am a, a young art woman, uh, Perth, Western Australia. 19th of August, three years ago, I had sent my grandson um, Dylan and my granddaughter Tiara to school. At this day, he came back on his own. And then I asked him, I said, why didn't you wait for your sister, Dylan? He just walked past me and didn't say a word. And I said, uh, Dylan, what happened? because I could see he put his um, head on the door, his hands on his uh, 
and resigned that he was just hitting at the fly wire door. Very, very upset, very stressed out. Hitting, hitting his head. I said, don't do that, I said to him. And he said, they've taken her, they've taken Tiara. And I said, where, what are you talking about, taking her? The welfare's taken her. And I thought, no, it couldn't have. And sure enough, they did. Tiara has been through a lot with her mother. Um, there was a lot of um, domestic violence and things that she's had seen. Tiara actually had um, um, seen her mum too when she committed suicide. Um, Now, there were six, seven people there to kidnap her from the school. I didn't know what to do. I was just, just so upset and crying that my head was... I just couldn't believe that they could do such a thing like that this day and age. I didn't know where she was. I spoke to the docks worker, and then she said, um, would you like to talk to her? I said, well, what do you think, I said. And then I spoke to Tiara, and then I heard a little voice at the end of the line, all the way over there. She said, Nan, I said, Nan. And I said, where are you? Because I didn't know, and, and no one would tell me, so I had asked my own granddaughter, and she was crying. They're flying her in, flying her out, like she was a, like a little parcel. And like she was an orphan. She's not an orphan, she's got family. We are her family. I just thought, you know, what did I do wrong? Tiara was uh, not getting on at school, you know, the issues and uh, walking out of the class and that. They thought it was coming from home, but there was a little boy who was bullying a Tiara at school. It was all this fabricated, all these lies that the doc said about me. I'm sending her to school with no lunch and everything. I've got a report from the principal from the school. And he said she's always been at school, always had her lunch, always did her homework. I knew I didn't do anything wrong. Now, then I went over and then I um, went to the courts and I had a few other grandmothers over there. I didn't know them. I was a stranger. They were strangers to me. We were all fighting for the same cause to get our grandchildren back. They said to me that I could have my granddaughter back, return her immediately. The um, lady from Docks brought her uh, to the motel, and I said, oh, really, I get butterflies, you know, real, oh, I was so happy. And then, um, then she pulled up and then she got out of the car and they'll see her. And she said to me, the first thing she said, and we gave back, she said, I knew you'd come, Nan. I knew you'd come and get me, she said, because I prayed, she said. I prayed. <laughs> 